Los Angeles, I'm coming down to see you October 21st to November 3rd. I have some good guests lined up and I'm looking for more. If you want to send someone my way or if you yourself have a story to tell, get in touch with me by Instagram DM at Chronicles of a Psychonaut. I want to let you know a few things going on with my store too. So I'm in the process of moving to Asia in probably December and I'm putting up all of my inventory online onto my Etsy store. And right now, everything in my store is 15% off. You can use the code word podcast. And I have uh, all kinds of shamanic tools. I'm putting up rattles right now. I'm putting up crystals. Uh, I'm going to be putting up tons of stuff this month. So check that out. My store is called Infinity Within. And you can find it at etsy.com slash shop slash infinity within or click the link in the description and use that code word podcast for 15% off. So we've done a couple episodes now about ayahuasca and I wanted to go a little more in depth now that we've talked about the basics of ceremony and the basics of the experience. And I invited my friend Aya to come on the show and she's done some deeper study and apprenticeship with ayahuasca and many other master plants as she's as she refers to them so we talked more about the dieta process what that is it's basically an extended amount of time where you're only working with plants and you're doing ayahuasca ceremonies and it often takes place in the jungle she's done several dietas so we got to hear about that and we also talked about what you can do when you start to get into trouble in ceremony. What I mean by that is if you start to feel overwhelmed or you start to feel fearful or if just things are getting intense, what do you do in that moment? And that's, I don't know how to put it, but that's, um, those are moments where you find out what you're made of. Um, and it helps to have some good tools as well to refer to. So, uh, we share some about that and we talk more about the integration process from a psychedelic experience or a ceremony experience, which I think is super important and, uh, not talked about often enough. So we go into that and yeah, it just was an all around really rich, powerful, valuable conversation. So. Hope you enjoy. First off, I want to thank you for being here today, Aya. And how do you say your last name? Um, in America, we say Bonagorio, and that's how I grew up hearing it. And I would like to think, or have heard it in Italy, pronounced more Bonagorio. Bonagorio. Yeah. Uh, okay, Aya Bonagorio. <laughs> Something like that. Something like that, okay. Um, well, I want to thank you for being here, and... I've done a couple episodes on ayahuasca ceremony and plant medicine ceremony, but um, you've had some more in-depth experiences with plant diets and also different kinds of ceremonies too. So I'm excited to hear more about that. But let's start by, I'd like to hear some of your like beginnings of how you first came to plant medicine. And Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know each other all that well, or at least I don't know, like your whole story. So uh, I'll get to hear it along with the audience for the first time. Yes, thank you. And I want to thank you, Finch, for one, inviting me on your show and for being open to the guidance to make this these conversations possible to be sharing with the world 
the integration of the work with plant spirit medicines and um, just really want to give thanks for everybody who is listening to this and feeling guided to to drop in with us today yeah yeah it's my pleasure Mm -hmm. uh i told you uh, but right before we started that i have had so many good conversations for two three four hours with people just one-on-one or or a small group and thought at the end of it wow i wish we had recorded that that was such a good conversation so you know it was only a matter of time before we got some mics and turned them on so and uh oh go ahead i just wanted to say lovely yes indeed <laughs> uh bring your mic up even closer yeah okay. so we can really hear you good okay so yeah um how did you we could we could go back to the very beginning, I guess, but, um, how did you first get into plant medicine? Like, how did you hear about it? And what was it that drew, what was it in you that, that made you like want to even step onto this path to begin with? Yeah, that's a great question. And it makes me immediately flash back to different moments, like in my childhood and in my youth, my young adult life. And it, makes me think, where do I want to start? (laughs) You know, because in high school, I had a, many of us were exposed to say cannabis, right? And Mm. having, this is like one of the first plant medicines that come into our field because we're exposed to it. Mm -hmm. Um, I can't necessarily say I had the most reverent um, introduction to working with that plant um, in the way that it's being maybe now cultivated today here in Northern California. Um, and then, you know, there are plants that we, we begin to ally as we go through life. And, um, you know, like every time we see maybe a cedar tree or we see a sunflower, or, you know, just as, as, as far back to just like seeing roses, you know, and every time you see a rose, it makes you happy. Like that's plant spirit medicine right there, you know, or every time your mom makes you chamomile tea to soothe your stomach, that's where the relationship with the plant spirit medicine begins, right? I... I do want to respond to your question. Um, I think you're more referencing the um, plant spirit medicine of um, this world of working with plants that are not necessarily psychedelic, but that um, are visionary, that give you an experience of um, a vision that you can utilize to heal and to integrate into your life in a way that helps you to live in a more um, sustainable, healthy way. And many of the plants are there to to help us they are there waiting for us to acknowledge them so that they can actually assist us to not only be well to feel well um, but to also raise the vibration of the planet by doing so so what i want to bring it back to is that um, one is our my seeking for um to get well in my life you know started at a young age because i had just in general, a difficult childhood. And many of us have had difficult childhood um, experiences. It's not easy to figure out how to be a human and to function on this earth. And some of us come into more challenging situations than others. And some of us um, continue to stay kind of locked down or suppressed or in habitual patterns. And then there are those of us who are really seeking. And so I was just, when I was kind of meditating on this, I was like, oh, this is going to be a little bit about talking about the hero's journey today Mm -hmm. and I never thought of myself in the context of the hero's journey but I realized that that's exactly what I've been taking and we have all been seeking many of us that come to these plant spirit medicines and ceremonies and these ways where we want to pray and clean ourselves out and get clear and heal as quick as possible we want to heal as quick as possible so we can be clear and be doing our service in the world and show up fuller and to not only love ourselves, but get ourselves out of the way so that we can be available for loving the planet and loving the people that are in our life, right? Mm -hmm. So so I'm kind of just want to keep coming back to that. So my journey started with um, a lot of personal suffering and desire to break free of that suffering. It's as simple as that, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And all humans can relate. We all have suffering and many of us desire to break free of it. Some of us don't necessarily find the right outlets. And then some of us are a little bit more determined or or risk taking. And um, and so there's a, a level of risk taking and even caution that I think needs to be taken 
um, when exploring and inviting in, say, plant medicines in these um, altered state experiences into your life. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're the start. So this is a lot of context, but I'm going to first speak to an experience that I had in, um, it was actually in Yosemite National Park. Um, the reason for this is because I had been cr- traveling, I was 18 years old. I had officially left home. I was born in Boston and raised in the East Coast. And I also ran away a lot <laughs> trying to break free of, of the confines of, of what felt like a limiting life. And I knew that I was truly meant to live a greater life. And so I had to sometimes just run away or break free of chains that felt were embedded on me and I made my way to the east coast sorry from the east coast to the west coast and when I made my way to the west coast I arrived at the redwood forest and when I arrived in the redwood forest for the first time I literally cried I felt the immensity of these like great ancient grandmother redwood trees and they told me that I was home (laughs) and it's as if I had taken this long journey my whole life to arrive in that forest to have these like ancient trees tell me that I had found home And um, through that, I started to um, stay in California and journey around California. And I felt myself seeking something in myself and I couldn't quite name it yet. But yes, it was a spiritual seeking and it was just wanting to break free of pain and willing to do whatever it takes. And I think in my um, personal experience of, of taking risks at a young age was based from knowing that there was something better out there for me. I didn't necessarily come from a family that um, always felt safe. So I felt like anything else out there had to have been better if I just, so I just kind of took the risk to sometimes jump off the cliff or, you know, take that medicine when, you know, maybe it was a risk to take that medicine. Some people kind of stay in a safe zone most of their life because they grew up with certain comforts. Um, So with that said, I was in Yosemite and I was hiking with my boyfriend at the time and we were 18 years old and we went on like a, a long hike up a mountain and it hadn't rained for about five months but we got to the top of this mountain crossed a river looked for a campsite somewhere where we wouldn't be found and lo and behold we it started raining for the first time in those five months and it's rained and then it hailed and we had to stay in a tent for four days wow four days yeah and it was like to the point where everything was getting wet and we were running out of food and we're like oh no what are we gonna do you know we're just like miles in the wilderness so there's this like edgy and all i know is that in that moment we were reading a book on shamanism there was like one book that we brought out there and there was there was a lot about plant spirit medicines and working with shamanic plants and plant allies and it was like really kind of the first time it was being introduced into my consciousness what was the book if you remember i actually i think it was just something like shamanism yes yeah, thank you for asking and i don't fully remember the name of the book and um, that's all right it's a yeah. while ago but there is a book that i will reference that comes through from that this experience is that um i kept i went outside and i kept hearing i and it was being whispered to me in the wind for those four days I was out there on top of the mountain. It was, ah, yeah. And I le- turned over to my boyfriend. And I was like, did you hear that? And I was like, he said, no. And I was like, I keep hearing this name being whispered to me. And he's like, that sounds like the name of a plant that was in the book we were reading. I don't know. Like, we were still kind of in this, I don't know. And um, meanwhile, we survived that journey, but we actually had to jump. We had to pack up in the wet cold rain and you know hike four miles down the mountain and we crossed a river that was really low um, before we got to the river and when we got back to the river it was rushing it Mm. was like rapids and then then you can imagine at that um a little few yards down the river was about like 300 foot waterfall Uh and i (laughs) fell into the river with my big hiking backpack on and i started to get pushed down the river and it was just extreme there's an extremity um somehow in this moment the light came through and i was able to grab a hold of a rock and pry myself out of the river and i was soaking wet so my big backpack was then like three times heavier mm-hmm. and i was cold and we just for some reason we survived there's like an adrenaline rush and it's like a hiking down the mountain 
and um and i'll never forget that because it was like i could have lost my life on that mountain in that moment Mm. and that and those that name kept coming through and one thing led to the other we got down the mountain we had to like get to a laundromat and dry everything and then we made our way to san francisco and first place we went was a bookstore and a book popped out of the shelf because we're like hmm hmm you know why why does this name keep coming to us and it was ayahuasca plant spirit medicines of the gods so that's a pretty popular book Mm. And we picked that up and read it through and we're like, hmm, maybe this is why we're being called to Hawaii. We had tickets to Hawaii at the time. So meanwhile, we're planning this trip to Hawaii and feeling like, wow, we're going to have this experience with ayahuasca soon. And in that moment, after reading the book and getting a little bit more informed about the immensity of the journey that um, ayahuasca brings on as a plant medicine, um, I could feel her in my field. Like I could feel the plant spirit in my field wanting to, she communicated with me first before I actually knew that she existed, we'll just say. Mm -hmm. And um, I do come across people who have that experience, who have had that experience. And what, what does that feel like more specifically to mm. have her in your field? That's a great For question. those who maybe haven't had that experience, how would you describe that? Um, it's like when you feel the presence of somebody in the room, but you actually don't see them. Mm-hmm. Or you feel the presence of somebody that you love and you're thinking of. Um, or somebody that maybe passed away, but you feel, yeah, it's just... It's feeling the presence of another entity. Mm -hmm. And most of us have that experience with other humans, Um, but there's an imprint, right? And Mm -hmm. so when you feel the presence of another being, there's an intelligence around that presence. There's a life force around that presence. And so there's, I felt this presence surrounding me and the life force of it. And it was coming into my field and in its own graceful, intricate way, unveiling itself to me. First, I felt the sign was like this life death experience on a mountain. And she's very much connected. Working with the medicine is very much um, known as the vine of the dead, meaning that um, ayahuasca or the word aya is the plant, is this ancestor or or the meaning death. It, It is also associated with being able to travel into the subconscious or into the realm of death. And to be able to do that in your human life, a lot of people don't ha- have the access to do that in their human life form. And so it's known as the finding of the dead because you can not only communicate with the ancestors and with, um, say, dead people, but like beyond that, the actual, um, I don't know, how would you say, quality with the element, what is death, right? That's a whole nother thing to break down, but you can die. You die. And part of like the shamanic death and the letting go of the ego is you have to let parts of yourself die. If you want to heal, if you want to receive a vision for healing, you have to allow yourself to die. And that's very painful and shedding skin. So so for some reason, the, the element of death just came through. So where was I in my train of thought? Uh, well, you you... You told me that you had crossed a river and survived that experience and the presence of ayahuasca, was you felt the presence before mm. like, or she, she kind mm-hmm. of sought you out. She did. And, um, and so I felt humility to her because of that. Like we learned about this medicine and we're like, oh, maybe we're going, we're feeling called to the island of Hawaii because this medicine's on Hawaii. We, we somehow learn that there was ayahuasca church in Hawaii or that the plant grows in, you know, the Amazon, but also the tropical environments that people have replanted her in the vine. And, um, so I'm speaking specifically right now of the ayahuasca plant, cause there are a lot of other plants that we could give voice to, mm-hmm. but I'm giving voice to her in this moment and my first initial experiences with her, um, which have really shaped and grown cause it's a, relationship that you develop over time with anybody you make a new friend and just think about how you know that friend for 10 years now and how it deepens so you can have a relationship with a plant and with her in the same context Mm -hmm. um so as i was being introduced to her and i understood we're maybe going to this island to have this experience what i understood is that we cannot go looking for her like she's a drug like I felt a humility, like I'm not going to go seek this out. Like it's a drug that I need to go take, you know? Mm-hmm. And cause that's a lot of how we think when we're in our mm, 
desire to have an altered state experience a lot of, I just remember as like a teenager I wanted to find a drug and I would go out and seek it and find mm-hmm. the people that sell it and then you know have the experience and this was more like whoa this is an experience that wants to come to me and change my life I need to be very humble and ready for it and so from and I'm grateful that I had that awareness mm. at that age and time because not everybody has that um, most people don't yeah yeah true they don't and so maybe this conversation can inspire them to tune into those subtle energies and i think that's a lot about what i actually wanted to talk about today was like having the the discernment and the intuitive awareness around when it's right timing Mm. and with who and when where i feel like those are some important things that i maybe want to touch on definitely because it's being very exposed today so just to continue that, um, I'm going to get to my first experience yeah. and then we can go oh, on to please. the next question. Um, I made it to Hawaii and actually um, it took, I didn't go looking for the ayahuasca church. I waited about five months and my boyfriend actually left the island. He missed his family, wanted to go home and I was like, uh-uh, I'm staying. And I went to, flew, flew to Kauai and it was the first time I was on my own like that in another island. I was 18 years old. So just to give you context, I was still a young adult. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And I started working with a yoga teacher, a yoga instructor, um, privately because we were doing contact yoga. um, And in that time, too, I entered for the first time a fast. I was fasting for five days. Um, It was the first time in my life that I was fasting even. And it was the end of that five-day fast and working intensely with this yoga teacher. And it was somebody who I trusted. And he, um, through conversation, he it came up, ayahuasca, and he showed me in that moment in that yoga studio that on his altar was actually a brew that he had made. Mm. And he took my hand, brought me outside and showed me the tree where he had been growing it for seven years. And then he's like, come back tonight. I'm going to prepare for you a ceremony. So in that con and I felt because of how it arrived in that moment and I had been fasting and preparing my field and was stopped looking for it, like stopped craving to look for it, that it came after five months of like this purification journey. Mm -hmm. And that night, all I can say, um, he held very pristine space for me. He was not a shaman or was nothing traditional about it. Um, but I experienced, um, past lives and future lives and it was this point in my life where I just felt a rebirth an absolute rebirth like remembered um remember choosing my parents choosing to come in through them and through that having a profound healing in my heart from my mother um who I hadn't been speaking to and um after that experience I was glowing for five months like something in my, I just could not stop smiling. I swear. I was just like, I understand like life now. I understand why I'm here and this like happiness and this opportunity to live again. And I saw a lot of things, um, everything from, you know, um, clouds turning into angelic beings and sending me messages to, to things about my father and my past or my past life or my past relationships that made me understand who I am today and why that journey was there for me. And so I called my mom on the phone the next day and I apologized for everything and just was like, I love you so much and thank you for being there for me. And And we just had this like moment of crying and apologizing to each other and accepting that we were on a journey together as mother and daughter. And so I'll never forget that, just like wanting to call my mom and thank her (laughs) for Mm -hmm. giving me life instead of being in that, resentment you know Mm -hmm. so that was a big boom door open rebirth and i'll let you know that after that initial experience i was not looking for her again there's a few times that it was actually being offered in my intuition or there were certain circumstances that showed me that it was not the right time Mm -hmm. or i actually was like trying to drive to a ceremony and got steered and lost in the forest and then find out the last the next day that it was all hoax anyways oh wow and so it was interesting how i felt there were always guides with me like protecting me um but i felt that she let me know the spirit i'm saying she it's a very feminine vine it's a very it's a grandmother you know she's mm. very wise 
um, being and intelligence. And these plants are way more intelligent than than most of us, than our us humans, our human race. Like they're laughing at us that we we think we're more intelligent or or you know powerful than they are, and they're humble about it. <laughs> and that's such an I think that's such an unusual perspective for most people to hear. Uh, like it I, might be, I, it I, might be radical. Well, I I think it would be, and it makes sense that it would be. Um, I've certainly had that experience. I feel completely humbled in the presence and intelligence of ayahuasca and some of the other plant spirits that I've been in contact with. Like their intelligence exceeds my own by such a degree that I can't even understand how Mm. intelligent it is. But I think culturally we're certainly raised. We, we think that we are the most intelligent species on the planet we think that plants are dumb, that they have no brain, which they don't have a brain, but they don't need a brain. I don't even understand the source of their intelligence. Um, I really don't. I can't explain it. Mm-hmm. But in the midst of these ceremonies, there's an undeniable experience of being being shown or told things or... Mm-hmm. It's even a hard experience to describe really like what that, what the presence of that intelligence is, but it's, it, it's so responsive too, is the thing. Like I can ask it questions directly, or sometimes I will just wonder questions to Mm -hmm. myself within myself, within the ceremony. And the answers will come to me from the intelligence of the plant spirit or, and sometimes it comes through in kind of like a, a thought form Sometimes it comes through in a visionary experience and yeah, it's like meeting the most intelligent master you can imagine who knows everything about you that you don't know and everything, everything about everything else. Yeah, exactly. And so there is this saying, um, be careful what you ask for (laughs) Yeah, because she most likely will bring it on. And, um, and so I've learned, you know, before going into ceremony to always pray, okay, I'm ready to see this now, or I'm ready to forgive this person now, but with ease and grace, you know, I'm ready to work through my muck, but with ease and grace, you know, cause then she hears that with ease and grace. She, and it turns out being a little bit more graceful than just being like, I'm ready to go to my own hell and shake it up. And then you're kind of like, she'll give you that too. Yeah. She'll give you that too. And you'll be like strangled all night, but then you'll get through it and you'll probably feel better after Yeah, and it'll probably stay that way. But, um, yeah, I wanted to say too, after my first experience at 18 years old, which is about, um, Oh dear. Maybe, I'm 34 now. Is that 18 years? 16. 16. Sorry. Yeah. I'm not good with math. That's what I was like. Yeah. Um, 16 years ago, um, she, I was informed also by her, I'm saying her and you're calling the medicine it. And so I just want to like, oh, use I, a different I, pronoun. I agree. It is. I, I have experienced sort of like a not a non sort of gendered, um, intelligence, but, um, I, I I've definitely, I definitely felt that. the femininity of ayahuasca too. I, I would agree with you that it's, more of a feminine spirit Mm -hmm. yeah and in all of these pronouns i think are okay i know that um like a road man that works with peyote and is like people always call peyote grandfather but but peyote is very feminine to me i think it you know it's both you know Mm. so he refers to it as kind of yeah Mm -hmm. uh one interesting well a a little bit of a tangent here but i've noticed that the the visionary experience of certain so-called feminine plants there the the actual visions have more curves in them or there's more of like a flowing mm. energy to it also the actual spirit that comes i feel is feminine but just the vision there's just the quality of the visions mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and what i've never done um peyote but san pedro which is also a mescaline cactus it the the it's very well linear i guess like it's it's the visions are in lines and i never put two and two together but the native american patterns that you often see on blankets and pottery that kind of like native american arrow pattern 
I saw that uh, on San Pedro, exactly mm, that, but it's mm-hmm. moving and it's multiple colors. Maybe more watery is, you know? In my experience, no, no, no. Well, I, I mean, watery. It's very, it was a very strong energy. I felt, I did feel that to be very masculine and, but yeah, there was more kind of lines with the, the masculine cactus in the actual visions than the sort of like curving, flowing, snake-like mm-hmm. ayahuasca type visions. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, just an interesting tangent. Yeah, actually, can I um, continue to tangent off on that in, in this moment? I feel like it's going to loop back around to our conversation about ayahuasca and the plant spirit medicines in general is um, in San Pedro, um, there's different names for it, as you know. There's the um, awakoya, or um, what is it they call in Peru? Um, Wach- Wachuma. Wachuma. Mm-hmm. Wachuma. And um, San Pedro was given by um, the Spanish mis- missionaries that came over from Spain to Peru and Ecuador because, um, you know, they are more Catholic or religious missionaries that saw um, St. Peter, San Pedro, is the one who opens the gates of heaven, Mm -hmm. right? So they gave it that name. But the traditional name, Awakoya, for example, it's how I was introduced by my Ecuadorian um, medicine woman that I work with. Awakoya means milk of the mother. Hmm. And if you open it up and you see the insides, the juice is like a milky sap, right? Mm -hmm. And that's where the medicine is. And I've experienced it to be one of the most emotional, like, like I've Mm. cried the most on it. I've Mm -hmm. menstruated the most on it. I've, I've, you know, experienced just like deep watery sensations and effects. Um, So when I, I much relate to that mother's milk, you know, Mm. and, um, but still there is a masculine aspect because it grows erect, you know, Mm -hmm. it has a very phallic, like, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so I think, we could say it's both or androgynous, right? Yeah. I, and I, I tend, that's how I personally tend to think of the plants. Like I, I think they have a dominant or even people, I think, or all of reality, I think has components of masculine and feminine. And mm-hmm. we have, may have, uh, we may lean to one side or the other and how we express either, uh, the shape of our body or yeah, the shape of a cactus or a vine or mm. the en- energetics and personality. But um, you s- in saying that actually r- reminds me that my San Pedro experiences have been also, well, it makes me feel very sensitive. Mm-hmm. Like I do feel, I haven't necessarily been emotional, but I actually don't really, per- I, I prefer the ayahuasca experience. It's easier for me to work with the energy to kind of like delved beneath the surface of myself and ayahuasca is more it's easier for me to meditate with it and to go into a deep internal space and wachuma i feel so much energy in my body and like traditionally i believe it's been used for like physical activities Mm -hmm. to eat some cactus before going on a long hike or Mm -hmm. going on a hunt it gives you a lot of physical energy and it increases my sensitivity to Mm -hmm. where like i'm and I feel like it increases my visual acuity as mm-hmm. well. Like I can actually see better and see sharper. Things are brighter. I can see the quality of things. I can see like the energy of plants or people. And it kind of heightens me in this way. But personally, I've, I've found it to be a little bit uncomfortable for mm-hmm. me. It's just, it's, I'm a very sensitive person to begin with. And it's just so much energy that, I feel like it's just going to burst out of my head and fingertips and heart. And uh, just, it's hard to just be, be with it, to be still with it. So yeah. Yeah. It seemingly doesn't end sometimes when you want it to end. And yeah, it lasts a long time, like 12 hours. So I wanted to just um, bring it back to um, maybe the, the aspect of seeking, because we're all seeking a spiritual, a mystical experience and healing experience. You know, there's like the spiritual seeking, there's wanting to touch on something mystical, and then there's like really wanting to heal. And, and what does that mean? To like really heal and have it be integrated and live your life in a better way. 
and all of these plant medicines that are available to us, um, you know, and what we're talking just about the ayahuasca and the washuma right now, and maybe we'll bring in, um, we'll talk about some other ways to work with plant medicines that don't does necessarily need to be so extreme. Um, they're all reaching the same goal. They're all to get us to the same place. Basically, it's just they all, you know, open the the doors of heaven and i heard it um stated in three different ways or especially with the ayahuasca that once you take the ayahuasca you're either going to school you're going to the hospital or you're going to heaven right one of those three things is taking place and all three of them can take place within one journey meaning Mm -hmm. like you're getting schooled on things like life is like you're getting some lessons too that you got to take that in seriously or you're going to the hospital like you need some surgery some things need to be like cut out of you (laughs) getting doctored doctored yeah that's another way getting well (laughs) is another way we put it Mm -hmm. so like it's not because i was i don't want to throw up i'm like you're not throwing up you're getting well Mm -hmm. (laughs) that stuff is coming out you don't need to keep it in you and then there's the going to heaven aspect which is that enlightenment which is the the part of the journey we're all seeking the bliss you know Mm -hmm. and then also um Maybe needing to integrate that after is what's the difficult part. Hmm. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, Well, let's go a little deeper. So, yeah, yeah, I want to take advantage of you being here and having so, so much experience. Um, Like, let's go kind of maybe beyond what even most people who've done ayahuasca ceremony. I mean, there's, there's, I think a lot of people have heard of ayahuasca now and far fewer have actually had an experience. Yeah. But uh, and would you say that you've been on a path of apprenticeship? Is that how you would classify it? Would you say that? Yeah. A um, path of study. Both. Yeah. yeah, I would use definitely both. Um, I would call it a medicine path, right? Mm. There's, um, and at different times, different medicines. It's like school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I've visited different schools Mm -hmm. of medicine, of lineage. And there's a couple now that I've stayed at and I've completed some, I guess you would say training, apprenticeship commitments, Mm -hmm. you know, um, and not all of them are using visionary medicines, I've found that the seeking has brought me to some traditional Native American paths and has opened up some lineages where I was able to um, really put my prayers on the earth and find what I really was looking for when I stopped consuming um, plants, when I stopped consuming products, when I stopped consuming, you know, attention from outside of myself. And so... I think maybe one thing I just wanted to to touch on is that I was I was seeking and what I was seeking was to stop consuming and to to shut off everything and to see what I was really made of when I stopped, you know, um, depending on resources from outside of myself. What do you mean by stop consuming? Like stop eating or well i did go to the degree of doing some traditional sweat not sweat lodges i did sweat lodges but um vision quests Mm -hmm. so you know when we called busquera de vision and and the camino rojo um there's so we have what's called the red road right Mm -hmm. there's the mm, there's no like green or white road but the red road is just kind of a an all around inclusive term for the native american ways Hmm. which you know are from the north to central to south american ways um more traditional maybe north american ways of say sweat lodges and sun dances and vision quests and so in this my quest for my thirst for knowledge and healing and um understanding of myself I felt that I was seeking a space where I could really be alone with myself and um, experience what was keeping me alive. And so that's where I had for many years um, actually had been imagining a family or a tribe out there that that could hold this space for me. And I, I could I could see and feel them, but I didn't know that they existed. And um, and then I met um, a man who became my life my partner for two years back 
mm, I think I was about 23 years old, 24 years old. And he brought me into this medicine family. And it was based on tradition of, of working with vision quests. And so, and they also worked with some plant medicine. Oh, that's my computer. Okay. Everything okay? Yeah, cool. it's fine. I just, yeah, it never does that, but right. go ahead. And he, so he had been doing vision quests and describing this to me. I realized that my soul was aching for that space where I could be alone in nature. And, um, I mean, a lot of us kind of go out into nature sometimes and have our own experiences, but I was seeking like a family that came together and prayed and cele celebrated life in these ways and protected life in these ways. And so I learned that there was a lineage and way of doing this is called Vision Quest and had been passed down by the ancestors, you know, and it had been done for many, many hundreds of years in a, in a container that allowed a person to go up on a mountain and seek vision and um and to come back down with a vision of wellness to take better care of themselves and their community and in that space you weren't really alone that people were protecting you but when you're up there you were not consuming water or food or any type of activity with other humans <laughs> mm -hmm. and when it was described to me i just my soul was able to just breathe and go oh that's what i've been craving for so long like i had done some psychedelic and visionary and plant medicines and i realized when i heard about the design of the vision quest that that was actually what i was seeking i was seeking a family that would hold me so that i could go out in nature and stop consuming everything and see what it was like even when i stopped having water and I'm just on, sleeping on the raw earth. Like, what is it that's keeping me alive in this moment? That's what I need to know because that's what's going to keep my spirit alive for the rest of my life. Like, what is keeping me alive when I stop consuming food, water, um, and then the, yeah, yeah, the comforts of life, like, you know, clothes, sex. I mean, I wasn't naked out there. I could have the comfort of, of clothes, you know, and after so many days, they will bring a little bit of water or they pray with tobacco or they bring you a little bit of fruit. But the first four days is like that, nothing. You know, you humble yourself and ask for support. And that way is not for everybody. Mm -hmm. I just want to make that very clear, mm -hmm. that vision quest or like <clears throat> this church or that way, you know, this medicine, ayahuasca is not for everybody, especially people with heart conditions or um, mental illnesses and um, high, low blood pressure, you know, things like that. There are contraindications to everything and not everybody who is seeking for healing or to connect with plant spirit medicines are going to find that they actually resonate with say ayahuasca with Shuma, or with the vision quest design. Um, you know, there's a lot of medical conditions that are contraindicative of going up on a mountain and fasting from food and water. It's mm -hmm. not highly suggested and it was never easy. And that's what I chose for my, I guess you'd call it warrior training, warriorist training at the time. Yeah. Okay. Beautiful. And uh, one thing I, uh, I've heard about vision quests is that one of the the ways that your the medicine family supports you is by like you're up there on the mountain and you're not eating or drinking but they they are and they're doing so for you is that the case yes. like they're, they're they're drinking water and eating food with you in mind and sort of like sending sending that energy to you uh, sending that support even though you're not in contact with them for yes. many days or this is what gives such beauty to the the design and the the lineage of it um it's it's what makes it different from like say going out in the wilderness by yourself and not telling people where you are and not eating food and water for many days without any instructions from say <laughs> an elder or a lineage or a teacher you know like in in my opinion that's not necessarily the smartest thing to do but um i was craving to do it in a container and so that's what happens in in a lot of traditional vision quests is you go up on the mountain and yeah you're not you're not seen and you're not communicating with anybody for those however four days seven nine thirty however it goes based on the the tradition and ways that you're committing to you most of the time it's a four-year commitment um it's like there's four directions four doors you make a minimal four-year commitment so um to just complete a cycle not all of us follow through with that for different conditions and reasons but 
while you're up there, there's a whole team of people below. There's a sacred fire. So that means that somebody's tending to the fire day and night while you're up on the mountain. That fire represents your life force, the life force of everybody who's on the mountain. That fire is cared for like a little baby is cared for. There's not one minute that goes by in the day so if you're on the mountain for seven days for seven days and seven nights there's somebody attentive to that fire and so whoever's at the vision quest camp is there in service of the vision questers and it's also their spiritual purpose and they're getting something out of being there and supporting that to happen a lot of people just in the pure act of service of supporting are also receiving the same benefits as almost being up on the mountain, especially mm -hmm. for those who have maybe medical conditions and can't actually do mm -hmm. vision quest, but they believe in the design. And so there's different altars There's the altar of the fire and right. There's the altar of the food, meaning that like, while you're on the mountain, people are taking pristine care of the kitchen and the food, every single piece of food that is made, and feeding the supporters those supporters are praying for the vision questers and energetically eating that as if it's nourishment for those who are on the mountain fasting so there's a energetic exchange you mm -hmm, know mm -hmm. and so that's just really beautiful and symbiotic about the the having that family and that design in place mm -hmm. um so that's just another school you know that's a school yeah. that i i committed to for i would say about eight years before i started to move on from that Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i mean what so what would you say is if uh you could like put, put it what, what what was the gem of that like what did you get from that i know that's like a huge question but um you know i mean that's so much time to spend up to, that's a lot of time to spend by yourself especially in a ceremony and I've never done a vision quest, but I've spent an extended amount of time by myself in nature. And that's a, it's a lot of time to fill. Like it's, I mean, when I say to fill, I think a lot of us are used to filling time. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's mm -hmm. like, there's this whole kind of, uh, ma magical idea of like doing a vision quest. Right. But then, I found when I was out there just watching the sun tick across the whole sky and I, I was dedicated to not being on my phone or, you know, I had a book. I wasn't like vision questing, but I was just out there in the desert in Sedona, just spending time out there and, and going on walks and things like that. But there's something, there's like a stillness that started to settle into me just being away from everything, you know, being mm -hmm. away from social media and phones, not being in contact with anyone. I noticed my mind just starting to wind down mm -hmm. and this sort of frantic anxiety in me that's often just kind of like um, at a, that's just at the baseline of my consciousness mm -hmm. of just going, 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 all these things to do all that's just started to slowly unwind and I was able to embrace more of like a spaciousness in me. And the desert for me is such a great place to do that. There's so much space out there. Mm. It's so quiet and still. And I found that being out there, it really showed me the ways that I'm not still, especially in the very beginning, the ways, and it, it, it can be, really uncomfortable mm -hmm. and a oh, lot of yeah. people I think kind of freak out about that kind of stuff those are usually the first three or four days is like when the system is um, unwinding that you see all that excess in Ayurveda you called vata but like the parts of yourself that have been unsettled for so long and mm -hmm. that you want to run away from and you have to like let that dust dust settle mm -hmm. and then you can return to your homeostasis or that more equanimity. Um, return to, wait, you just said, you actually answered a lot of that question. <laughs> and um, can you repeat it? Like what was the gem or can you repeat what was the initial question there? Oh, I, I was asking like what, what did you get out of that experience of being up there and, and, yeah, tran transitioning from like, what did you do with your time, or mm, how did you fill mm -hmm. your time, or or how did that mm -hmm. time fill you? 
Yeah. So I find with a lot of these, um, one, like I commitments that I've made. So like making commitment to work with a plant spirit medicine or a lineage or a vision quest, or I'm also moon dancer. So for day for a night ritual so these type of commitments you make um, when you hear about them and I everybody does this it's a very romanticized idea of like what's gonna happen same thing like it's like marriage and children like oh I want to be married and have kids and have this like happy life you know we romanticize that idea we romanticize spiritual work too definitely and um you know I t explain people this dance that I do with women they're like I want to do that sounds the most amazing thing and then they get there and it's like every little detail of getting there and being there is so like difficult and brings your stuff up and it's uncomfortable and so I find that like every time <laughs> I whether it's like vision quest or, or drinking that that thick bitter sweet cup of ayahuasca that makes you gag as it goes down into your belly you know it's good for you but um there's that like there's a moment where it hits you and the work comes on mm -hmm. that means it's it's pushing your your stuff to surface this is the real work. That's the moment of the real work. When your stuff, everything that's aggravating you, everything that's been suppressed, everything that's uncomfortable and it starts to churn and you get nauseous and sick and you want to run away from you, you don't want to look at it. And there's that moment like where it wants to surface and purge. Where it can purge, you can vomit or you can cry or you can just kick and scream or you can continue to try to push it back down and under. But whatever that struggle is, that's the work. Mm -hmm. right and so that's the moment that we're all actually waiting to arrive to that's the climax like when we say we want to heal and do that healing work we're actually waiting for that moment to arrive and that's what we fear so much right mm. it's that stuff that we know we want to surface that's stuck and we're afraid of what it's going to look like when it comes out and um oh i'm just going to take a breath into that right now yeah because i can <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah it's i think like f for me a lot of my life journey was just sneaking up to the edge of that point and maybe i still am in some ways of making that commitment to myself and to doing that work i mean i've been doing that work for a long that's time that's it that's actually what i want to talk about yeah keep going. yeah yeah i think well it takes tremendous courage to well, okay, I'll come back. So, <laughs> uh, you you landed on it when you were, you said you were talking about this romantic notion of mm -hmm. spiritual work and plant medicine, and I think ayahuasca ha is very romanticized, and plant medicine and spirituality is very romanticized in general. And shamans are like put on a pedestal and relegated to you know the these like gurus right and there's moments that she's very romantic and she oh, dances course. with you and it's sensual and you're like oh i'm loving this i want to go back to that place. definitely yeah like all of that is true mm -hmm. and there's more mm -hmm. and i think that that and I, I tend to focus on sort of that other side in my episodes a lot or in my conversations or just in my life and perspective because I think it's so important and you could call that shadow, the shadow work. Right. Mm -hmm. And like you said, um, she takes you to school, to the doctor or to heaven. Right. Mm -hmm. And everyone wants to go to heaven. Who doesn't want to go to heaven? <laughs> but you also have to do the other too. Totally. And, um, especially if you want to go to heaven and stay there. If you want to cultivate a lightness of being in yourself, it's the shadow work that liberates you in order to do so and the courage and commitment it takes to face oneself in that way uh is tremendous and uh -huh. I, uh -huh. I know i have and i've seen it in so many friends there part of the journey is kind of dipping in and dipping out there's this uh two steps forward one step back of because whatever it is that's your shadow work that's the the most challenging part of you mm. and maybe someone else's shadow work is not your shadow work and it's and you know um the things that challenge others might be our strengths or vice versa but whatever your work it is it's gonna 
that's something that's going to challenge you, maybe scare you. Um, and quite often they are the parts of ourselves that we've avoided the yes. most and that we most exactly. try to escape. The reason that we fill time, the reason that we are, yeah, just, and the, the value of kind of embracing the spaciousness and, and facing ourselves is so that we can grow past those boundary points that we, that are self-imposed or that are a product mm -hmm. of our experience and be more fulfilling and in service right i yeah. think a lot of us really just want to live life more fulfilled and be more in service of our gifts and that's why we're like when we hear about the real work we're like oh yeah i want you know how many of you get there's there's those of us that get thrilled like oh i want to do the real work and then it comes and you get scared of it and run away mm -hmm. and so actually going forward with that um i want to talk about the commitment and the mm. gratification that comes when you follow through with with a commitment to yourself like mm. that and so the most when you asked me what i got out of it the first thing that actually came to my mind was that and then we kept talking so i forgot about it but i was like ah i was able to for the first time in my life when i did vision quest and actually moon dance that happened consecutively at the same time and for four years and so I had made these commitments and it was the first time in my life that like I followed through with that commitment every single year I showed up for myself and I followed through with that. And it was up until that point in my life, I had never followed through consecutively with such a difficult thing. And each year there was challenges to showing up and I still did it. And so I, you know, there's just, there's gratification when you do follow through with commitments that you make to yourself and, um, and you acknowledge that it wasn't easy and it was difficult and challenging and uncomfortable. So, um, so commitment to yourself and your self growth, you know, and at the end of that, I find that, excuse me, at the end of, um, a commitment that you make on a spiritual path or journey or lineage or practice, Maybe we just have our own spiritual sadhana. There's sometimes there's an acknowledgement, you know, and in some traditions you get like, you know, you get different, I don't know, acknowledgements, we'll say. I, in the Native American tradition, you get a chanupa or a putanwa, a pipe, right? And there's just different ways that you're acknowledged for the that commitment you and work that you did. And then even like a gift to carry out the responsibility of it. And, um, I have to say, even those moments where you complete a, a body of work and commitment, that for sure there's this feeling of like gratification and almost like pride in yourself, confidence mm. growing, and then other people acknowledging you and almost praising you or looking up to you for having done that and wishing that they had done that for themselves mm. and they admire you. But then what comes after that, it's like there's kind of a crash. And we don't always talk about the crash that happens. And it's like that's... It's, and a lot of us would talk about those of us that finished maybe our four years of vision quest would be like the now the real work's beginning the real work is in in that next year or two of integrating with those four years were can be actually kind of depressing or for some of us difficult because then all of the blessings that we received in the vision and in the insights in those places where we got back to our center we need to now integrate that in our life and that's the hard part the the integrating and actually embodying it and there are some things that naturally just integrate and you become embodied in and you can see that you can see the people that are walking around and they're embodied in the values and, and in the pieces that they receive from medicine path and how they're servicing their gifts and then there are some pieces that are just they don't land right away they take many years to integrate or to land or to even resolve mm. yeah it's kind of based on our own karma in our own path in our own it's very personal like when you ask me about my relationship or my experience it's personal and how you know one plant responds to you it might respond to me completely different and then there are similarities based on the chemical constituents of that plant and how it is studied and known to affect people and so then there's like a general you know expected outcome or experience and then there's like the actual experience that we have because of our karma personal physiology and karma mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and is that making sense yeah definitely okay. definitely yeah and yeah we can go from there just to talking 
Well, we, we were talking before we turned the mics on a little bit about integration, right? Mm-hmm. And and this is part of the integration process. Like, um, and yeah, I did another episode with my friend Jesse about, he talked about a big crash that he had after mm. doing a lot of like three years of pretty steady ayahuasca work. And then, and I've also had my own crash experiences too. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's common. Mm-hmm. And for both of us and that, we were talking about how unexpected that was. And mm-hmm. I, and that's definitely not part of the romantic story that's oh, yeah. often told, but it's part of people's experience. So maybe we can explore that, like why that comes about or, or how to kind of work with that. Mm-hmm. There, there's, there is sort of like a heaviness that come that can come in. And I'd like to hear what you think. Um, my theory is that like, I've always thought about medicine work some people think of medicine work as cheating that like, and I, I don't, I don't agree with that, but that I, I do think that, um, you don't get anything necessarily from like, you have to earn every step of the way yourself is what uh-huh. I'm, is what I'm getting at. Uh-huh. Like ayahuasca is not going to save you. No person's going to save you. Like in order to get to where you want to go, you have to earn every step of that Uh and i think it's important to say that and also that can be a difficult reality to embrace i think because it's hard to do that and i i think a lot of us don't like to do hard things and but i think that's the reality that like so what i've always thought about plant medicine ceremonies that are a tool they offer us perspective and it's like you're lost in the forest or you're lost in the desert and you get up in the ayahuasca hot air balloon or whatever plant medicine Mm -hmm. mushrooms or whatever Mm -hmm. and it brings you up to a height that you normally don't have and you get to see the surrounding area of yourself you get to see your own inner landscape and you can get an orientation from that you can see oh wow these are the obstacles that are in my way from where I am now to my goal. But then you, that hot air balloon brings you down and you are exactly back where you were. And, but the only thing you have is this sort of knowledge and memory from the experience. Right. And you have to apply that. Now from there, if you have like a very dedicated direction and you're like, okay, had this experience it showed me what i need to do now i'm gonna go implement that and move towards my goal some people are like that but a lot of us just sort of end up getting lost again Mm -hmm. we're like want to get back in that balloon or maybe just keep getting back in that balloon over and over Mm -hmm. but it the balloon always brings you back down and you have to start walking and you gotta you gotta Mm -hmm. walk over those hills Mm -hmm. all those obstacles that you saw you're like oh it's just right there my goal is just right there and Mm -hmm. just go over that hill over that hill But then the actual experience of overcoming the things within our, our, ourselves, our deepest obstacles, um, our most core wounds that can take time. And sometimes it's frustrating to feel like, wow, it's, it's like my salvation. My liberation is right there. I've felt it. I've, Mm -hmm. I've experienced it. You know, I've, I've, experienced being completely totally liberated like ayahuasca has brought me to heaven and samadhi bliss and why can't i be there all the time right okay (laughs) yeah this is this is a big and important topic and we could just focus on the integration of ayahuasca plant spirit medicines of um even spiritual enlightenment, because not all of us reach it with plant medicine. Some of us have gone on extensive retreats, even meditation retreats or fasting or this or that, where we reached those places that you spoke of. And then there's the crash. There's like, oh, I found it finally. And then you find yourself trying to integrate and you're in your your old identity and old skins are, are trying to stay on you. You're, you know, that old mask is like, 
trying to put itself back on you every day and you're trying to take it off and then there's like this little tug of war mm. and some of the mask peels off and some of it stays and the part that stays still it can just be utterly depressing that it's still there because mm. oh, i just did all this work why are you still there mm -hmm. and i thought i worked on you I thought you'd be gone forever and you're still there and you're still making me suffer and and then it can almost create even more extreme dynamic in the brain because you're you start to grieve now that you you had the touched enlightenment and now you're still suffering the exact same way you were before you expect you had hoped or wished or expected it to have gone a little bit better or easier <laughs> like why couldn't you be easier on me and then there is and then this is the real work actually the real work there's like being courageous and in overcoming some obstacles during ceremonies or vision quests or during the consumption of medicines i know every time i consume a medicine or go on a deep journey i'm like oh no why did i do this to myself again right when you're at the climax of everything like you know shit hitting the fan or everything getting turned inside of you i just remember getting to this point of like why did i drink that medicine again oh mm -hmm. no here i go like no turning back you know i took the green pill the red pill or and then you get through to the other side because you hold on because you're strong and you know and you trust yourself to be strong enough if you don't know and trust yourself to be strong enough i hope to god and all the angels out there that you're with somebody who believes in you and can hold that space for you mm. so that is another topic is being in a safe space with a shaman or a guide that you know trust that you trust to hold the space when you don't believe in yourself mm. but i want to bring back to that that integration point because what i am um feeling called to share before i began my journeys deepening with um, working with ayahuasca and so I had a break from 18 years old to like 23 and when this new partner that I spoke of came into my life um, we went full power <laughs> into like hundreds of ceremonies together but I had in between that period like the ayahuasca after my first experience was like I'm going to be working with you I'm going to be a strong guide in your life, but you need to do some groundwork first. You need mm. to ground yourself out, girl. And so I spent many years doing some groundwork and then boom, she came back in full power, exactly how I had perceived her telling me it. <laughs> and with that said, before that happened, I was in Arizona, Diamond Mountain University. It was this kind of Buddhist school out in the desert, the high desert and the mountains. And I went into just an immersion of studying Buddhism and wanted to immerse into sadhana and spiritual practices. Um, and I'll never forget that one winter, I was like in a tent in the freezing cold and like just doing my practices, mindfulness, checking in with myself every day. And um, this is before that immersion period came on with the plant spirit medicines. And I was, you know, my background is in yoga. And so I became a certified yoga instructor at 19 years old. So I had yoga and then a little bit of Buddhism. And in that moment when I was studying there, I knew that I was calling in this medicine path. And I met a woman. I'll never forget this, the imprint she left on me because in her own, I can't even... Um, relay how she put it but she she informed me like oh i've been down that path of ayahuasca and plant spirit medicines for about 10 years i was down that path and i'm going to assure you that there's nothing there for you everything you need is here in your practice in your meditation practice you need to like don't even she was basically saying you don't need to go there this is the real work you're already doing it here every day showing up for your meditation practice your mindfulness practice da, 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 da. and when she said that to me there was a sense of i already made a decision in my mind and i know i'm going towards working with ayahuasca and plant spirit medicine so even those women's telling me something and if there's was a feeling that there might be some truth in it. It was not at all convincing to me at that point in time. But now I'm remembering it today because the most important thing is how we show up every day. And so returning to our spiritual practice, that's all we, all we have is the present moment and what we have in our daily life to keep us healthy and functioning and whole. And so I'm remembering the the moment that she said that to me and how it rings true today it's like right now the most important thing to me is having a developed 
not only a daily practice, like right now I'm I'm trying to figure out what daily practice routine works for me that keeps me centered and clear um, and remembering everything that I've learned in ceremony so that I can be living it because the the real work is in living it. Like every moment, keeping integrity with my relations, with all my relations, not only with the humans, the people I interact with, strangers, people I love, but also with the water I drink and the plants that I step on when I go outside of the house or the, you know, everything that I have relation with, how to stay in integrity and good relation with those things as I move through daily life, how to, um, you know, how I'm smiling or present when I'm in line at the bank or not. Maybe I'm angry and irritated and having, you know, um, generating selfish thoughts, right? So when are we, are we, ge- are we generating selfish thoughts and greed and thinking about ourselves? Or are we thinking about other people? And are we generating loving kindness? Because then when I was practicing Buddhism, it was all about generating loving kindness in our thoughts towards every deed and action that we were doing throughout the day and then check in ourselves if we were or we weren't in that space of loving kindness and consideration. So in a way, it does go back to the practice. And what that woman was sharing was true. It's all about loving kindness and being present in the moment and checking in. Like, am I being selfish or am I being in that place of, um, I guess you'd say, non-duality? Mm-hmm. Um, I'd like to talk more a little bit about your experience with dietas if mm, yeah, you it's feel fine. ready to shift yeah. yeah yeah um because this is something that well I I've never done a dieta before and I haven't had somebody on yet mm. who has so okay okay perhaps we can just start by talking about what what is a dieta um and uh, you can go for that. I'm sure you can say describe it a little better than I can. Okay, yeah. Dieta is this word in Spanish that means diet. And so you're talking about, a, I think, maybe a plant spirit diet, specifically working with the ayahuasca. And so I would say that a lot of the tribes in the Amazon jungle, not all of them, but in general, there's a, there's a commonality of of working with a diet before consuming this medicine um medicine being combination of a vine and the chakruna leaf and um combination of these plants um so with that said there it's similar to kind of the the mentality of of not consuming things that are stimulating so that when this plant goes into your body into your system that this plant and the spirit of this plant and the alkaloids in the plant can actually read what's going on in your physiology and in your emotional mental and spiritual body and it can read and go deeper it can help you on a greater level so it's like when you show discipline to the plant through your diet then it reflects that back through maybe getting in there deeper because we're not we're not creating obtrusions right there's things that like certain oils and salts clog our arteries right so we can't allow medicine to flow through our blood or veins you know we can't get oxygen flow to deficient areas so it's very similar um excuse me so the plant works in a way where she it it she doesn't like certain foods and we've noticed that over time and it's been pretty commonly known throughout a majority of the lineages, not all of them, or there's lineages in different schools and I guess religions around ayahuasca in South America now. And um, we found in general that, you know, if you avoid salt, alcohol, sex, processed sugar, caffeine, um, any type of red meats, you know, oils, oils specifically, Mm -hmm. yeah, all oils actually. Um, so there are, yeah, these elements. You have to eat a pretty bland diet to avoid all of those things. And, but, and that's often right part. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So basically you still do eat and we, 
we kind of make fun of it here. We say we call it the carbohydrate diet. <laughs> <laughs> you're eating carbohydrates. You're e- you're eating very very bland food. And if you're out in the jungle doing this diet, um, and it can happen anywhere from like seven days to fourteen days to two months to some people have dieted for six months to a year. It depends. If you're more training to be a shaman, then you would go in more extensive diet. Most Americans that go down to the jungle to do a diet um, usually spend anywhere from you know a week to a couple of weeks dieting and those who maybe have a little bit more experience might go for a month or two but that's again pretty extensive for a lot of us Americans or humans that are living you know a modernized lifestyle a lot can be accomplished in a short amount of time with the right diet um and in this diet there is somewhat this um container of isolation again it's the same concept that are speaking of in the vision quest it's like you're you're not consuming you're away from technology you're away from stimulating activity whether it's loud noise and technology or just being in relationship with other people you're not talking to other people you're not using soaps you're not um, sexually active or even masturbating if you do follow the diet properly then you reap more results and if you don't follow it properly then the results can be a little bit watered down or um, it could even be a little distorting depending on the plants that you're working with and the the shaman as well because sometimes the shamans have a little bit more strict guidelines um, and there's a lot of things that determine that so the diet in general is um you'll see basic like um green plantains you know kind of like your they're just boiled plantains or potatoes lentils but again there's no oil or salt or anything rice quinoa um sometimes they'll give you a little bit of freshwater fish if you need the protein or like a boiled hard boiled egg to get a little bit of protein in there but um it's been very bland um some oatmeal i've had at times um where i've gone actually it's done like a little bit of shredded carrot at times it's so nice when they give you like a little bit of vegetable and you're like oh yes vegetables you know fibers and then the fibers help you poop so and then you never think about that but it's important (laughs) um especially just eating like two meals of carbohydrates three meals of carbohydrates today it's like you you feel it but at the same time you you actually still do become very thin um, because you're consuming a master plant. So I, we didn't quite talk about that yet, that there are other plants that you work with coinciding the dieta. And so a lot of times you're working with a dieta, it's because you want to reap greater benefits with the ayahuasca and show reverence and respect to this this master, this, this knowledge. And we don't have to call her master because that might be kind of, um, yeah, not the right semantic to use on the podcast, but this this very intelligent plant that we want to learn from and receive blessings and healing from. And so we'll go on a dieta. And I've done dietas here in the States, and I've done them in the jungle where you traditionally do them. Um, and I do find that there's greater benefit and less distraction in the jungle, <laughs> although there are a whole other field of um, plants and insects and animals and things to be aware of in the jungle that can be an obstacle as well and it's all part of the journey but dieta in general um you there are different master plants so this is the part that not everybody knows about is that there are different plants that have different um one spirit medicine and chemical constituents that can really help one could clean the blood or or stop the proliferation of cancer cells or to you know heal the body of bacteria and viruses um yeah you name it like some of them are really grounding and protecting plants some of you know we work with trees with shrubs with um different plants that are um, just known to to be very intelligent besides ayahuasca so what's going to happen in a dieta depending on say the shaman or medicine man or woman that you work with and their knowledge of the plants where you are um they're going to work with you to decide a master plant that you're going to work with. And um, that master plant you're going to diet on, say, for seven days or 10 days. And so they prepare for you the diet. You're being served the, you know, the plain carbohydrate dish like once or twice a day. And then you're drinking the plant medicine um, maybe two or three times a day, depending on the you know, again, the the dosage, but you're drinking this other medicine. So that other medicine 
the other plant spirit, the other plant master spirit, we say, is going into your body and your body is becoming attuned so that that one plant can go inside and to completely work you and replenish you from like head to toe. Most of this is boosting the immune system and clearing out stagnant energies. And some of them are tingling, you know, some of them, they all have different qualities. Some of them tingle and create heat. Others are cooling. Others are good for the blood and for the heart. So like I said, they all have different attributes depending on what you're deciding to work with. Um, and then what's going to happen is you're consuming this master plant and then every couple of days you are going in and drinking ayahuasca and having ceremony with the ayahuasca and the ayahuasca helps you to perceive on most much more subtle levels how that master plant is working allying you does that make sense yeah cool and um Many times the master plants themselves are not psychoactive, correct? Exactly. They're not psychoactive. So I'm not sure if some of them are, but I know the majority of them are not, or at least many of the ones that I've heard of. Yeah, mo I, I don't know any that are actually psychoactive, but they can actually be um, enhancing your journey with the ayahuasca. So sometimes right. ayahuasca brews are mixed with, say, like Chirisanango or, or Bobinzana, and you'll notice that that plant ally is also influencing the ayahuasca journey as well. Right. And so the ayahuasca is allied with these master plants and they're working together to give you even more supreme journey. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, so you feel actually the spirits, you feel some, I guess you would say healing spirits or spirits of the plants. They come in through the ayahuasca journeys and ikaros. There are songs that you that you use to beckon the spirits of these plants to come in and to do deeper healing work. And that's when they start to do some surgery on you, you could say, you know, mm -hmm. they go into your system and you start to feel different circuits or DNA rewiring and things purging out and memories coming through or feelings and sensations. Um, it can be a whole range of things just depending on what plant you're working with and what you're going through at that moment in time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I haven't had an experience of that, like the surgery, but I've heard of um, a friend of mine and teacher, uh, Johnny Coyote is his name. He's, he talks about the doctors, the yeah. doctor spirits that Dr. come. Dr. Sito. And, yeah. This is chanted a lot. And, you know, surgery from a Western perspective is like a dangerous, scary thing, right, mm -hmm. to undergo mm -hmm. surgery. Mm -hmm. But um, as I understand it, um, well, I mean being doctored can can be scary too if you don't know what's going on but it's more of like a an energetic thing and yeah like he's described actually like he's seen the doctors they look like doctors they're men that wear that are wearing like um i don't know white uh, doctor suits, doctor suits scrubs or whatever okay. like like he sees these spiritual beings that look like doctors yeah they're spirits they're oh. they're doctors <laughs> and um, they 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 come and they work on him and you know he lets them because they're there to help exactly yeah and um, and he well he's a ceremony facilitator and he's I don't know if he works with those particular beings but he's he's come to know some of these beings that work through him that you know he creates the channel for them to come work and mm -hmm. as do the plants right mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. but going back to the master plants so these different plants have different qualities or personalities or characteristics and mm -hmm. they're all teachers mm -hmm. and the reason for taking and i guess you could probably say ayahuasca is a master plant as well and ayahuasca is often combined with other plants like the brew itself mm -hmm. most commonly chacruna but mm -hmm. many other plants like you said um well, can chacruna be... is a is a main attribute to activate the alkaloids in plant to actually create right. a visionary experience or right yeah for it to be ayahuasca yeah it has to have well we talked about it in a previous episode but um uh, ayahuasca itself doesn't contain DMT or any kind of like the visionary alkaloids, but it sort of opens the gates for it with by inhibit mm -hmm. inhibiting the enzymes that break down DMT. So you'll have ayahuasca, the plant, and then 
yeah, uh, another DMT containing plant like Chakruna or um, Wambisa, or there's a lot of plants that can be brewed into ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. But separate from the mm -hmm. actual ayahuasca that you're drinking, you're drinking the tea mm -hmm. of the master plant that you're dieting. And so what are some of the attributes or like personalities of some of these teachers mm, that you're familiar yeah. with or personalities great name um i mean a great <laughs> way to say it um a first plant that i actually dieted on which is um it was the mapacho and um mapacho is a jungle tobacco and it's extremely purgative mm -hmm. um and it's not um one of the most easy plants to begin to work with but right. um tobacco as some of you may know um is a protective plant so when it's not being consumed with additives that are addictive um this really pure jungle tobacco is actually it's very strong it's very astringent it's antiviral and bacterial um and i was introduced to it actually in hawaii with the shaman that i was working with there and um as a result i was drinking the juice we were making like kind of like a tea out of it it was very hard to swallow that tea mm. but i did it um twice a day sunrise sunset and at the time i would actually to um um, puff smoke of the the mapacho in the four directions and pray and as i swallowed it into my stomach and there's times i was nauseous mm. i was like i didn't know if i was gonna hold it in um i was also being taught to to swallow the tobacco smoke into my stomach again another way to create protection and created like this round this body of protection around my body so the the spirit of the tobacco and this goes all the way back to like the Native Americans growing corn and tobacco and they lived off of that and the buffalo, right? So that was like all you needed at one point. Tobacco um, for me is a great, is one of the strongest allies that I've ever had in my life. And I think it's because it's the first plant that I ever did a dieta with. Um, and I've, I have such respect for tobacco and also how I've learned to work with it in Native American traditions is you, you know, we also pray with it. We utilize it for, for prayer and for asking for commitments and asking for teachings. You gift your teacher a bag of tobacco, right? Hmm. And they use that tobacco to pray with your intention or to pray for the community. Anyways, it, it's just a symbiotic relationship. It grows out of the earth, so it's connected to the earth, but it needs to be cured and dried in a certain way. And um, those who... Um, when you smoke it, when you, you know, add the sacred fire to the the dry leaf, then you puff it and it connects to your mouth, your saliva, your DNA, and it sends the prayers up to creator. And I've seen it actually in a medicine ceremony when I was first working with medicine ceremony and sacred fire ceremonies. I saw when the sun was rising in the morning and the chief was like praying with his tobacco. And I just started to see the energy of the tobacco, like taking the prayers. I could see the smoke, like gathering the prayers that were being spoken and like sending them back up to the sky and the heavens. And I was just like, I started to see how the tobacco was intelligent and working. But when I was in dieta with it, I, it was very, um, it started to just purge. It purged a lot of um, negativity in my body. Yeah. And, um, also, I felt it was very anti-parasitic um, physically and energetically. Um, so, so I felt a few things. Like it can carry your prayers really strongly. So you have to be careful. And if you ask for something with that tobacco, it holds you to that commitment. Like tobacco, you can really pray with it because it, it carries the prayers. Or if you're asking, giving teacher, like here, I want to learn this song from you. Here's a pouch of tobacco. Then that tobacco is going to really hold hold you to learning that song if that person decides to pass to you the song the medicine of the song can be better received with that exchange right so i'm giving just some examples of how ally i've allied the plant of tobacco through first working with it in dieta um by the end of that dieta <laughs> i actually ended the two-year relationship that i had started that had actually started me on this medicine path it was like it had cycled and showed me that this is now over and the last cords were kind of cut and so the the medicine the tobacco and that diet actually helped cut some cords for me 
and then left me with this amazing ally for the rest of my life. I know whenever I'm having a hard time, struggling, I'm like, where's the tobacco? I need to go outside and I need to go pray right now. Whether, you know, there's many different ways to pray with tobacco and I won't get into that here today. Um, There's, you know, different ways that people work and utilize. And then there's your own personal relationship with the plant. Like you can go learn from this person and they can tell you how they have prayed or worked with tobacco or with this plant for their entire life. And you can start to copy it or you can just learn by having a dieta or like really spending time with that plant and listening to it and seeing what it asking permissions and seeing what it has to Mm -hmm. offer you and then it's your ally you know when you when you show and sacrifice your time and your food and your energy to learn from that plant then um great having a new friend or ally or teacher there it's going to be with you for the rest of your life Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. yeah that's what i wanted to say about that yeah and I understand that in order to gain these plants as allies, you, this isn't like, this isn't symbolic, you know, like you, you can't just go through the motions and, and like, okay, I did the diet and I have this plant ally now. Like you have to actually show up at, like with that full commitment of self and, and be willing and go through the whole journey, like be available, be present to that journey and do that work for and I know my friend he said that it took well he asked he asked my friend Johnny he asked his teacher like how to learn how to work with tobacco because Mm, his mm -hmm. his teacher is this like old Peruvian man um who worked with tobacco he was a healer he and he could do incredible things with tobacco Mm -hmm. and so he asked Mm -hmm. him how how do I learn how to heal like you do and he said, um, he said, smoke your pipe and pray, pray, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, smoke your pipe and pray. And, um, you have to put just like any other relationship. If you want to get to know somebody, you have to spend time with them. And if you really, if you really want to get to know them, it's up to you. Like how vulnerable are you willing to be? How, mm. what barriers to intimacy do you have to, you know, like there's a lot of people that, all of their relationships only go to a certain level of depth because that's the level of depth that they're willing to, to go to, to, to open themselves to. So with these plants, it's kind of like they have the open hand extended and, and you know, how do you want to put in the time to get to know them? Let right. them get to know you. Slow down and listen to them. Yeah. yeah. Instead of just take. Right. And, and, and open yourself to, to them. Yeah. Exactly. And the same thing with, um, I would say that the Icaros, the healing song, the songs that call in the spirits of these plants that we diet on Mm. or the healing spirits associated with the plants. And and just to give you an example, um, when I was in a dieta a year and a half ago, um, I went to the and I had a great, I have a great relationship with the shaman, the medicine man, and um, we sometimes play music together um, and I found I was in dieta. I wanted to learn some of his Icaros. I was like, what is that one that you played? I want to learn it. And he looked at me and goes, he knows I'm a song curious. So he's, oh, no, 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 Aya. You must receive the mm. song. Mm-hmm. You're here to receive them. Don't go looking for copying or, or you know, like, yeah, mm-hmm. l- let it come to you. Mm. They're going to come. Listen, you know, mm-hmm. you can receive it. And it, and it, got me to slow down and listen and I was spending a lot of time then catching everything that I was hearing and hoping you know that that these songs were going to come or these plants were going to come and teach me their songs and I I started to catch some you know and then some are still coming and some never quite came the way that I wished that they did and I felt a little like frustrated with that process and I'm like okay I'm not I'm not there yet I'm I'm humbling myself because to carry their songs is is quite an honor it's a deep deep honor that means that they truly are allies and that they truly will come when i call them Mm. yeah Mm -hmm. and so i mean yeah i want to talk to you about that that experience of receiving a song you touched on a little bit but Mm -hmm. as i understand it um these ikaros like they they 
the real power songs, they've all been received in that way. And mm-hmm. it's like, there's all these really beautiful songs. And I don't know how many people realize that like these songs are, were not written. Like nobody like came up with the melody and the lyrics that they actually, that those songs come from the plants. They come from an experience of getting to know those plants in this way that we're talking about. And then they'll bring you their song mm-hmm. and teach you their exactly. song within the ceremonial experience or how however it comes about so Mm -hmm. so you've you've received a song in that in that fashion I have yeah I've received a couple you Mm -hmm. know and they come in their own their own way and fashion and right timing Mm -hmm. um there's many songs that are um on the other side there Mm -hmm. shall I say Mm -hmm. there's the Icaros and then in, say, Brazil, they have the hymns or henarios. Um, these are hymns, are um, their entire song books, you know, that are comprised of these different songs that are channeled, I guess, or that come from the astral. Like these are other songs that are received, but they're more in the form of hymns. They're not exactly associated with a plant spirit, but they're maybe received some of them are. Some of them are actually like religious. They they're actually referring to Jesus or Mary or to um, an Orisha, you know, a, another entity, um, um, elementals of different beings that that work out there in Brazil. And there's a different celebration, but every song um, has a key that it basic. It's like a code that unlocks the subconscious mind, and these are codes that that download into our DNA and help us to release memory, um, disease, blocked emotion. And they get in there and they, those songs, the vibration and the, the actual frequency of this. Sometimes it's the lyrics of the songs. Like I noticed more in Brazil because I learned Portuguese and I started to understand these, these hymns. I learned hundreds of them. They are all so beautiful and melodic as opposed to the Icaros are a little bit more hypnotic. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. And um, it doesn't quite matter except that they all – carry these keys like one would like the words would unlock different places in the mind that needed to understand healing and releasing letting go and there's just really you know some heart songs they're so simple but they just help you tap into the energy of your heart and if there's grief in your heart it can release mm. and it's as simple as that mm-hmm. and then others just like wow there's some genetic codes and things that have been passed down genetically from our ancestors that you know the the ikaros can sometimes like really weave like the same way that the ikaros work with ayahuasca is very serpent like it goes into our dna it spirals into those memories and subconscious patterns and it can start to you know purge them out of us Mm -hmm. so i like to i like to think of the songs as like these code keys and they are entities and they are very alive mm-hmm. and there's a lot of information and they're healing. They're like mantras and they, so they are received and when they're being received, there needs to be humility, you know, in the same way that like, I don't know, in, in ceremony, you become hypersensitive, um, your senses, all of your senses, um, sometimes audibly, physically, um, emotionally but um all of our sense organs sometimes very often become heightened and so when you feel the vibration of somebody singing or playing an instrument it amplifies like a hundred times more than you might be used to Mm -hmm. right and so the the tone of the the voice or the ikaro or song that's being carried is going to penetrate a lot deeper Mm. and has that much more capacity to heal Mm -hmm. or to harm you right because we haven't we're talking kind of about the healing aspect of the plant but there there's a flip side to everything for the amount of like good healing miracles that it can do it can actually equally do that much amount of harm if in the wrong hand or intention totally i've had the experience of hearing someone well many people sing really beautiful songs that are coming from their heart and coming from a relationship to those plants where they're they call they're actually calling in this the power of those plants and so ikaros have mm-hmm. different ikaros have different purposes like you're saying they're, they're keys right mm-hmm. and um 
sometimes there's like a like a, a purgative ikaro that brings on the power of the medicine and everyone in the ceremony starts purging like it was silent and then the song just like brings the healing on right mm-hmm. and exactly and i've had experiences on the other side too of sitting in ceremony with a young shaman who was trying to show off and just like so was r- r- singing back. from a place of ego and mm-hmm. the vibrations coming through the voice like i it was gross it like was gross, and it yeah. was just yeah like um bombarding my field and i had to kind of like put up you know kind of put up my shields and exactly like, um and you know the the scary thing i guess is like not everyone knows how to do that and uh-huh. um like not everyone is aware of what's going on i could feel that i could feel what was coming off of him what's coming through the song where his head was at where his heart was at oh yeah because like, you're psychic in that field we're very psychic and vulnerable and so yeah. whoever's putting out the vibration of the song if they're in that ego it can cause harm yeah definitely right yeah it was coming out sharp not soothing so how would you um offer i feel like actually it's important to maybe speak to a tool of protection that people like how do you shield yourself what could you offer to the audience that's listening if they end up in that situation i think there's many things to do but i think the most important thing to do is to not go into a place of fear Mm -hmm. like well i'm i'm aware in that moment that i direct my own experience Mm -hmm. that we're all in a ceremony space together but i'm in my own personal ceremony space as well Mm -hmm. like my own my own kind of auric field if you want that extends one arm's length from my whole body that's about where i feel like my field is and i'm aware that i'm the the master of that realm there Mm -hmm. and that i can choose uh what kind of energies that i want to interact with and what i don't so i prefer to be in a safe space where i can kind of let down my shield and and if there's just really good energy in the ceremony space to just sort of like blend with all of that and Mm -hmm. allow, allow that in. Mm -hmm. But if there's crazy shit going on, then I just, I come into my own, it's hard to describe, I guess, like in terms of a tool, but this is just what I do. Mm -hmm. I just kind of close that field. And not in a place of fear or negativity, but just, I'm like, I don't want any part of this, you know? Mm -hmm. And I can still hear the sounds, but the energy is not coming into me. Or I'm in this place where like, this is my choice. I'm not allowing this to affect me. Mm. And I'm just going to sit in my own, on my throne of stillness in the midst of the storm until it passes. Mm -hmm. Um, and usually it does pass. Mm-hmm. I, I've never been in a, a situation where I felt like I had to leave a ceremony or really super crazy stuff was going on. Um, but yeah, I don't know. That's what I do, but um, I don't know. I don't know. What, what, do you, what would you have to say about that? I think that's great. Um I was just thinking about what would, what, yeah, what do I do or what would I do and what have I done? And so it was just got me thinking a little bit deeper. And I think everybody has their own tools that they harness to call upon for protection and those that work for them. So what works for me might not work for you, but I, I agree with you. That's just like not to do all you can to avoid going into fear Mm -hmm. and to strengthen your own essence in that moment like just come back to yourself okay like for me it'd be okay i'm aya aya i'm just gonna tap into aya essence more strengthen my field and avoid the fear and avoid the field of somebody else it's hard when you're in context of ceremony i i was thinking oh i would first grab my tobacco mm-hmm. <laughs> and start praying with it because that ally helps me out mm-hmm. in a time of need so i was like that's my ally and I have some crystals, so I would probably start working with the crystals or some essential oils that I feel are protecting. Or So I, I feel like there's some things that I would grab, you mm-hmm. know, and I wear actually a red a lot of times in ceremony. Um, I've learned from 
in Mexico and Mexica people, I work with a, a faja or um, a red belt over my waist. And that belt, depending if I'm menstruating, it's over my lower abdomen. Um, and I'm particular about being in ceremony to also when menstruating. That's a whole nother topic. But um, also it will cover my navel because the navel is that, that sensitive point where energy can leak out of or into. So that's like what I've been taught is to cover the navel with the red belt. And also some of us, um, we wear it over our forehead third eye area as mm -hmm. well this sort of protection around the crown of the head so um i've worked with some communities um like in colombia there i noticed that people take a lot of precaution um the the arwaku the different yeah different people from the punta Mayo jungle they take a lot of precaution around protection when they do ceremonies almost in a superstitious way like i, I think there's a fine line between kind of being superstitious about like protecting yourself overly protecting yourself and like the need to have protection and shields mm. um but you know when they came to the states they made everybody who was in ceremony take an herbal bath before entering into their ceremony and then they had like marked their foreheads with like red lines and you know just had um they were working with a lot of herbs and prayers and different pastes on their face and markings to to create what for them felt like protection to be able to come into our world mm -hmm. <laughs> and do their work. Mm -hmm. And so what do you need to be able to go into this plant spirit world or this ceremony and do your work and feel like you have your your protection or that safe place to come back to mm -hmm. if you need to, if you need to take a break? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And in, in saying that, you reminded me of some other moments where I did feel like I was starting to go into a place of fear or I f was starting to feel overwhelmed of like the the pressure that or like the, the storm was starting to get to me and I started to question my ability to hold it at bay. And I, I did go to a place of prayer, actually, which is not my sort of like first go-to I guess with the way that I was raised um, didn't have any kind of religion or spirituality and I've always just kind of relied upon myself but in that moment of just feeling like this is slipping away and I don't I don't want something bad to happen to me yeah I think prayer is a beautiful tool call in help you know and if there's specific spirits mm. or angels or allies exactly. call in your spirit guides or angels yeah. in that moment yeah yeah, when all fails, it's like faith is what saves you and keeps mm. you going, you know? Mm -hmm. And I had heard, you know, I, I really actually don't know very much about angels or these kind of like, I never got super deep into that, but I'm aware of them. And I had this moment in ceremony where I started to feel like I was being overtaken by like dark energies. There was, a, mm -hmm. it was the same young american shaman that i had mentioned before and mm -hmm. it was a two-night ceremony and the second ceremony i was uh way more tired because i had been up the whole night before and there was just this super dense heavy energy that came over the space that put everyone to sleep it was like it was like trying to move through molasses and it just it was i could feel it like coming in and I even spoke up and I asked, I asked him to, for Olympia or a clearing. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. he responded back so weakly. He was like almost asleep himself. So it was like dark, dark energy. Maybe was also overtaking him a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. He was mm -hmm. like, <laughs> I mean, he was no help at all. Mm -hmm. And, um, so this dark molasses energy is just super heavy and super dense came in. And then I could feel all these like dark spirits come through it. Like, like the vibration of the space lowered enough to where they could get to us. And he was completely useless, not mm -hmm. aware of this, mm -hmm. not and this, his job to be aware of this mm -hmm. and to, to mm -hmm. raise the frequency of the ceremony up and the space up so that, um, those were protected from that. And he was not able to do that. And um, so I felt in danger and I, I was mm. trying to stay awake and I was having such a hard time, like not, it, it was so difficult to keep this 
energy out of my mind. It was penetrating me. And I knew that I was going to fall prey to it. I wasn't able to get out of it. I could barely move. And all I could do was pray. Mm -hmm. And I thought of Archangel Michael. He's the Mm -hmm. one that came to me. who was like a being that I think I'd never prayed to before. I wasn't even very familiar with, but I was familiar. I knew, know him as a protective spirit. And yeah, he, he is the warrior. He has that sword. He's the protector. And you can call on him to come like, you know, fight the demons or whatever. Um, And so many different traditions have a a figure like this, an archetype like this. Thank you. And so I called in Archangel Michael and I was just, I was like humbled. I was like, I need help. I need help. (laughs) And um, Mm. I don't know what I was expecting. I mean, I've seen images of him, but what came to me was and i was on my back at this point i was just looking up and i had my eyes closed and um this light came in and i actually saw this light behind my closed eyes and it started out as a point of light and it expanded into a geometry which looked sort of like metatron's cube it wasn't exactly that but it was the or like a sri yantra or something like that it was these uh overlapping geometries of like triangles and squares and and this pattern and it just sort of like um fanned out like this web almost like a dome like uh, this protection over me and Mm -hmm. it was like glistening like pearlescent blue and white and i just started like sighing these huge size of relief and i just felt (sighs) and i because i was so (laughs) i was so on edge i was so like tense Mm. with worry because i could feel this darkness coming over me and i couldn't i was powerless to do anything about it and i and so i just started to relax i felt safe and yeah i was like held in this in this container by this being and and but other people were not Mm. and i could see the spirits that came through and they looked exactly like the dementors from harry potter if you're familiar with (laughs) this and what what these beings look like they're they're very like kind of ghoulish they're sort of like they and the astral is very aquatic like it's it's aqueous it's water-like and they swim like spirits swim through this astral medium Mm -hmm. and so these spirits kind of like swum in through this and they they sort of have this sort of snake-like body white snake-like body and they have a head with no face they also kind of look like the uh the nazgul from lord of the rings where they have this head but you look into them and there's just this hole where their face is and this hole is their mouth and they like came and they like hovered over other people and they were just like feeding off of them just like drawing energy out of them and it was freaking scary man like and i was just like i can't even believe i'm seeing this like yeah i even questioned but i was like this is why we need to take some precaution around uh, and sorry i didn't mean to interrupt no um, yeah please but thank you thank you for sharing and articulating that and um there are a lot of colonies of beings on the other side that are not in our highest good they're quite malicious and they will feed off of us and um and i know this isn't pleasant to hear but we all know that they exist we know that exists that hungry ghosts and um and as you spoke to um archangel miguel or um to san miguel or you know many different ways to say that name um I actually want to share a little bit about him in a moment. But what I want to speak to is, one, I'm really sorry that you had that experience of being in a ceremony and extending your trust to a shaman, medicine man, and having it not be a safe zone. And I congratulate you for navigating your way out of that and for the self-mastery that comes from finding your guide in a moment of need. And... I want everybody who's like listening to really get this, to really know your no, 
to really before ceremony like do you, if you're craving this experience with the ayahuasca there is a lot of illegit illegitimate shamans people that maybe have good intentions but have not done the work you know doing the work would be like two, three years in a dieta, you know, and having a lineage master pass down their permission instead of you taking permission. And there's just a lot around my opinion of what legitimizes um, maybe a shaman. <laughs> but um, I more want to make sure that you don't end up in a vulnerable space where you're not safe and these hungry ghosts or these spirits with malicious intentions towards you or other people can enter into the space because it's a leaky container, right? Because that shaman doesn't have the tools to actually hold the container or be aware that something's coming in that could actually be very detrimental and harmful to you. So um, I've had these experiences as well. And yes, it might be that you're meant to have that experience and fall from grace and to find that um, your guides are there to save you through. and um, But I hope and wish for all of you that you don't have to end up in one of those experiences that maybe we've had to go through as part of our initiation. But I want to encourage you in the same way that I spoke at the beginning of the podcast is just to really use your intuition and do your homework. And your intuition, your gut is going to tell you if this is somebody that you can trust and do your homework, find out about the history of the shaman. And, um, you know, before you just extend your trust um, without blind faith, yeah, before you just have blind faith and extend trust to somebody because you think it's cool or you just so eagerly want to have an experience, you might want to consider the consequences because, yes, you could have the most miraculous healing of your life and it could be very insightful and help break you through to the other side, but it is not worth letting, um, what is it called, malicious spirits in that one, that could be also feeding off you and giving you more heavy work to have to do after. Um, so I want you to honor your no, and when that no is there, even if you don't know why your no is there, to listen to it in your gut. I just feel like it's important this day and age. Super important. Um, and there, I, I would say of all the people out there leading ceremony, um, far there, it's a, it's a minority of people who actually know what they're doing. Yeah. I would say most people, maybe even the vast majority of people leading ceremony don't have proper training. Um, and even in Peru, like, uh, and mm -hmm. my, my friend who mm -hmm. I haven't been to Peru yet, but, um, yeah, he's been on the path more than 20 years. He's worked with a number of teachers down in Peru and, and um, since the mid-90s. And he, he went to work with anybody he could find. He wanted to just, unless he got a really bad feeling with mm -hmm. them, but he wanted to experience all of the different ceremony leaders down there and see their different ways and many different tribes. because yeah, you're curious. And sure. so you want to expand your options, but then, yeah, you have to be precautious yeah but i asked him so of all of the people down there in peru you know peruvian shamans what percentage of them would you say like really actually know what they're doing and he said 10 percent mm -hmm. and that's down that's down in peru of mm -hmm. people who might even be connected to lineages right mm -hmm. so then you know what are our odds up here in the u.s and I don't mean to, you know, I'm not trying to like put people off of this or anything, but I think it is super important to just be aware that like every time I go to ceremony, even with my teacher who I trust, I mean, he's really one of the only people that I trust um, to actually like hold a safe space. But I, and I, I, the shaman that I was talking about, the younger one, I was aware of going into this because uh, I, I had known him for a while. I'm like, yeah, this might be a situation where I have to hold my own space. So mm -hmm. this isn't, this mm -hmm. isn't a ceremony where I want to go up to the altar and drink three cups, you know, like mm -hmm. I want to, my basic strategy, especially with a person, a new person that I've never sat in ceremony with before is I want to be able, I'm not, I don't want to extend myself beyond my sort of like point of control. And I've had enough experience now where I, 
I'm familiar with the ceremonial experience. I'm familiar with myself and ceremony and the mm-hmm. plants where I kind of know like where my limit is for back of a lack of a better term. Right. But you know, like I'm, I'm going into that ceremony also getting to know that shaman. Mm-hmm. So I'm not going to just go in there and like go max out mm-hmm. and potentially like fall apart. And mm-hmm. that's not even a fun, really fun experience or mm-hmm. even, uh, not to say it doesn't have value, but I don't, I don't need that. Right. Like I don't need to be, thrashed in ceremony like i want to work with the medicine in a way that i can actually integrate and it's not about how much ayahuasca can you drink there's no kind of like contest and in fact you're gonna get you're gonna get humbled up pretty quick if you're just trying to see how much ayahuasca you can drink right it's it's and and it's not about being uncomfortable like how uncomfortable can you get to, to prove a certain amount of strength to yourself. And I right. find that there's some people have this mentality of like the more uncomfortable things that I do, then the stronger that I'm going to be. Right. And, um, Trial you know, and I, I had a little bit of this mentality Me at too. first. I was like, okay, warriorist, like, let's do it. And um, I want to see what I'm made of. But also my teachers, some of my female teachers reminded me that like, we can do this work and not deprive ourselves of basic comfort. Yeah, Stop definitely. beating yourself up and yeah, do the real effing work. <laughs> right. There's, yeah, like there, I think it's important to be kind to ourselves, right? While not uh, coming off of our, like our edge. And what I mean by that is I think that there's a sustainable pace. There's a point where we're not pushing ourselves too much. Like we're hanging out in our comfort zone or our escapism too much. And it's like, okay, like it's time to like get back on the horse and you know, Mm -hmm. it's time, time to get going down the road. And then we can also push ourselves way too hard. Um, Mm -hmm. I know for me, part of what was pushing me really hard was I was ultimately dissatisfied with myself. I was like, I can, I don't like the way that I am. I want to change things about myself. Um, here's the things that I want to change. Here's the amount of work that I have to do. And if I can just get all of this work done, then I'll feel better about myself, you know, and I can accept myself if I, Mm. if I can just change these things. Exactly. And it just had me going as hard as I could because I wanted to live the rest of my life free of that. And so I was just really like kind of an inner workaholic, but I think that uh, this is a long, a long journey, perhaps longer than this lifetime. And I think it's important to also enjoy, enjoy it too. Mm -hmm. Um, And not just like try and max yourself out all the time. Bathroom break. Okay. Go go for it. Yeah. So we're coming to a close fairly soon. And um, you're going to, I understand you're going to share a song with us. Oh yeah. Um, which we'll do at the, at the end after we kind of wrap up the episode. But is there anything else that you wanted to talk about or share as we close? There's a few things that popped into my head and I'm trying to think how to, briefly pass through them one actually when you started talking about um the the archangel michael and um i was thinking of my relationship to him in the santo daime church so santo daime is actually a it's an ayahuasca yahe religion in brazil um and in this um, context, I found that that church wasn't necessarily my path per se, but I took away many gems in, in from that experience and from being in ritual with them and learning some of the songs. And um, I go back, they have different concentrations of work and my favorite work, the only work that I will ever go to <laughs> over the past few years, like when I would drop in on that community, it will be the St. Michael work of San Miguel. And so it's an entire concentration of hymns around the Archangel Michael or Michael. And that entire night is focusing on calling that angel in. Hmm. So you're basically channeling his presence or the presence. It's not even a, a, yeah, maybe it's masculine, but I don't like to even, I think an angel is more androgynous, but um, 
it was really beautiful work because when you explained the light that came in for you, it was very um, similar to when we start to call in the angels in that ceremony. You just start to see, you feel an orb of light entering the mm. room, basically. Mm -hmm. And it's blue and it's just, it just lifts you, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like you don't see like an actual angel flying through. No, it's like it's an orb of light and energy and it's a field. Mm -hmm. And it's so protective and it's helped me because it's like, you know, his, the, his energy is like cutting through things that are illusions, that are painful, that are in the way and protecting. And I always found that like I was able to just move through a bunch of mental gunk of like, thoughts and patterns and critics stuff that was you know getting in the way of me being fully sovereign hmm. in my energy um the number one thing i got from working with that angel is realizing that um in these ceremonies i would like well in my daily life i spend so much time thinking that something's wrong with me you know and that i'm sick here or something's wrong here in my body or my intestine or my womb or my head and in the ceremony it's like the angel came and scanned through my body and showed me that I'm completely healthy and vibrant in every cell in my body and that it's my mind in those places that were actually creating the disease. Mm -hmm. And so that was a big takeaway. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing that um, there's a, there's a few things that I would like to touch on, but maybe in a later episode or in some of the work that I might be doing with women or that I do do with women is just talking about the woman um, honoring their bodies, um, their sexual energy, and even their moon cycle within the context of ceremony. Mm -hmm. um, I think the things that I want to touch on today is that um, one is ceremony is not a space for um, running sexual energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it doesn't matter how attracted you are to a shaman or to another person in a ceremony. Um, I, I do know people who have met in ayahuasca ceremonies and have even become um, life partners as a result, which is beautiful and always a miracle when that happens. But I also really want to caution people to to keep that energy closed and sealed and um if there is a connection that wants to be made to make it outside of the context of the ceremony. And if somebody is not honoring or respecting that, then that's not somebody that you actually want to associate with. If it's somebody who can honor the boundary and the honoring of not running sexual energy during that time, then that might be a sign that it's a safe zone to associate and meet outside of circle. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Cause that's just a lot. Um, this is a big topic, you know, and there's a lot going on of like shamans um, misleading with their sexual energy or using their power and their psychic powers to mislead, manipulate into real, um, young, vulnerable women into, into their beds. Yeah. Literally. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's something I've I've never witnessed that, but I've heard a lot of stories about that happening, and especially in Peru, but up here too, and it's been happening for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, it's mm -hmm. like an on, ongoing thing, mm -hmm. and um, uh, yeah. Well, there's and there's something else too that we didn't talk about at all. Um, there's like a whole dark sect of like brujos and dark shamans and uh, you know people mm -hmm. like which pe people who use their power for selfish means and psychic warfare psychic yeah. warfare black magic that i mean uh, and the jungle sounds like a pretty crazy place i haven't felt called to go down there because i have a teacher up here who mm -hmm. is great mm -hmm. and he's been down there and he's done a lot of work and he is a legitimate healer and yes. I like to work with him. And some people f say like, oh, no, to get the real experience, you got to go down to the jungle. And uh, I don't know. I I can't, I, I don't have the perspective or the experience to contrast it, but I certainly get a lot out of, you know, wherever I am physically, just being in that kind of safe container, uh, really high intentional ceremony and just going going deep within I feel like it's more important where I am located internally than where I am located externally and who I'm with 
Yeah. What I would say in regards to that is um, less is more. Yeah. If you trust where you are and if the energy is running in a way that is congruent to your needs and harmonious to your lifestyle and your needs, then continue with your yes. You know, like when you find home with one teacher, stay in that one home. If you don't have to continue to seek outside of that one place, everything you need is right there in that one focal point, that one fireplace, that one teacher that one altar mm. it's not necessarily like oh maybe it's something better here or there or there because it's, it tends to be our mentality is we're never getting enough and there has to be something better or different here and um there's a there is a time and place to maybe visit other schools right and um and so i just encourage you guys that when you get to that place that feels good and there's a resonant yes in every cell in your body or there's at least that feeling of like I need to stay here and keep going here um, to trust that so that your energy is not overextended or leaking. And um, we're trying to clean these things up, right? This is why we're going to these schools. They're trying to clean up those those places of ourself that are that are overextended and leaking. And we want to be full in our power. So um, I encourage you just just let go of the FOMO, I guess, the fear of missing out. And um, there is one other thing I wanted to touch on in that context. Let me just see if I can catch it. <laughs> oh, well, actually wanted to invite, since we're not going deep into the topic, is just um, any woman that are listening to this that might be going through a challenging time in um, community and context with their, their sexual energy. Um, whether it be a time on their cycle or in relationship to a significant other um, or to understanding their sexual energy in the context of another person, um, I really would invite you to just come and have a conversation with me about it. I'm available to help um, integrate, um, to assert boundaries, and to, to offer some tools. And that's part of what I do in my life is just offering women tools to strengthen their boundaries and um, have more sexual sovereignty. And um, I just feel like that's important. And I have navigated through um, something that was about a four or five year spell that was put on me by a male ayahuasca shaman. And I'd be happy to share that in another time and place, just what I've navigated through and how it's helped me to to be more fierce in my boundaries and my power and more clear with the energy that I'm running. And um, there's certain things that we are just naive and we allow into our field at different times in our life and that we play with. And we need to be careful with how we're playing with that power that we hold in our wombs and in our bodies. So I just wanted to reaffirm that because it's an important time to be reminded mm -hmm. of the power that we have and that we have over other people. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, well, this has been super rich, and mm -hmm. um, I definitely feel like mm -hmm. there's uh, there's more to say and more. Yeah, I'd love to hear some more of your stories. Um, which it's it's good to feel that to sit down with someone for two two and a half hours and to feel like you're just barely scratching the surface. So. Ooh, yeah. So um, I want to thank you again for coming to share with us. And what's a good way for people to get in touch with you if um, people do want to reach out? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, so I have uh, two websites. Um, the work that I do with women is called obsidianwomb.com. And so you can email me at obsidianwombsister. Um, and then another contact would be um, just the other branch of work that I do with movement healing arts is divinehealingmovement.com. Divine Healing Movement. Mm -hmm. And um, and then divine there's spelled D I V I N E. Okay, like, okay gotcha. Yeah. Some people spell, so that's kind of like a code word for ayahuasca sometimes. Uh, D divine. It's divine. D E yo. <laughs> divine, you know? Yeah, yeah. I like that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. And so uh, tell us a little bit about the song that you're going to share today. Oh, yes. Um, so I was just in, um, I was in a dieta back in. June, the beginning of June this year, 
And um, as I was traveling, I actually just started to receive the song. Um, and actually was coming, approaching my birthday. And so the song is in Spanish and it's not uh, an Icaro per se. It's actually a song about about the abuela and about the grandmother's spirit and how she sings to me and she sings to my heart and she's, you know, she heals my heart. And I also bring in this medicine of the, the mariposas, the butterfly. And I speak about the, I sing to the butterfly spirit too because the butterfly spirit, um, my mom named me after this um, name that means butterfly and she gave me this butterfly spirit totem that's followed me around my entire life so I started to sing to the butterfly and to just the 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 healing spirit in essence that is in all of us that wants to awaken and so these there are these ancient I think spirits that are around us our ancestors that are around us that that do sing to us and that want to help us the want to guide us and so I felt that they were just entering me in the song and inviting me to to open up and sing with them a little bit so that's a little bit about the song um i am just grateful to be here thank you yeah thank, thank you, you so, so much. much yeah <laughs> all right so uh we're gonna take a little break and get set up and come right back with the song okay. thanks everyone thank you Open to 
I definitely plan on doing another episode with Aya. So if you have some questions that you want to hear us cover or topics, uh, please let me know. You can comment on this episode's post on Facebook or Instagram. Find me at Chronicles of a Psychonaut. Uh, you can also send me a DM if you don't want to comment. Um, I'm having Halo back very soon. She's coming in um, this week to talk more about ta Tantra. So if you have some questions for Halo, you can also comment on the Tantra post, which is episode 12. Um, and let me know what kind of things you would want to hear more in depth about Tantra. That's it for now. See you next week. <laughs>